the Republican Party that I grew up in, I think, was very libertarian. Um, you know, I grew up in the Goldwater era and the Reagan era. I cast my first book, vote for Reagan, um, in 1980. So, you know, I, I always thought that libertarianism was consistent with republicanism. Um, I discovered that maybe it's not so much anymore. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions about that. Like some people think that, that being a libertarian is is all about being a libertine and doing whatever the heck you want. But but I, I think it's more about keeping politics out of very important personal decisions, cultural decisions, community decisions. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think that most people live their lives as libertarians. They just don't realize it. You know, I mean, we live our, live our lives and you know, our neighbors next door are having a problem. We just stay out of their way. You know, we don't you know, unless they're hurting us, we don't bother them. We don't care what they're doing, you know, behind their closed doors for the most part. And so I think most people live as libertarians. Um, and and I think you're right, though, that, that from a political standpoint, that too many people have started to think that um, libertarians just mean, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll or whatever, you know. And, and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm pretty boring. I always tell people I'm probably the most boring libertarian around. Well, this idea that, that somehow we can sort of outsource uh, institutions and, and, and civil culture and really tough moral decisions to politics and have a, like a 5-4 decision about whether or not such and such is the right thing to do, that seems absurd to me. Well, you know, if you don't think, um, you know, and, and the thing is that if you don't think that um, the 5-4 decision is a good idea, um, if you don't think that those those nine humans on the Supreme Court can make that decision, why do we think that you know 435 legislators can make that decision? I mean, we're all human. Um, how, what, what gives us the right to make decisions for anybody else? Um, you know, outside of the realm of general public safety and protecting life, liberty, and freedom. Um, you know, in states especially where you have um, one very strong party and a very weak party. So in Nebraska, the Republicans are very strong at this point. The, the Democrats aren't so strong. Um, you know, I think in places like that, the libertarians have the potential to peel off some from both sides and maybe move up. Um, I think that the, the libertarians will probably be um, at their best. This is just me guessing, but um, I think they'll be at their best regionally for a while. And there are some places where there's a better um, kind of a bit better regional opportunity um, than others. But um, I think that, you know, over the next 10 or 15 years, especially if they can um, if they can get some wins, I, I think that it will be um, it'll be promising for the party. Too many times when we get you know locked into left, right, Republican, Democrat, um, whatever, that that it's hard for us to negotiate honestly with one another. Um, those in the progressive side of the body know that on civil liberties issues, I'm going to be with them, and those on the you know on, on the, the 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 right know that on tax and spending issues, I'm going to be with them. And so um, it's some of those things that you know kind of in the in the middle that we have um, the, the discussions about. You mentioned this uh, sort of triggering moment where you decided to leave the Republican Party and your fight with the governor over the death penalty. This is kind of an interesting issue because I'm talking to more and more conservatives who are having second thoughts about the death penalty, but still you have our, our president sort of randomly calling out the death penalty for all drug dealers. Um, what is your position on the death penalty? Well, I don't trust government, and I don't trust government to do the right thing. Um, you know, we have a case in Nebraska it's called Beatrice Six. Um, there were six people who were, um, who, who were convicted of a crime. They were threatened with the death penalty. They were convicted of a crime. They spent 17 years in prison and were later um, completely, um, completely exonerated because um, DNA evidence and somebody else, um, somebody else admitted to it. So. Um, if you can do that with the death penalty through threats and things like that, I think there's a, a moral problem there. Um, beyond that, you know, there are absolutely some issues out there. There are absolutely some conditions out there where, you know, you and I would say, yeah, that deserves the death penalty. Things are just so heinous. Of course, you can't define heinous in statute. And so it's, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. Um, but I think that it's important for us to consider 
um, you know, consider the nature of the, the, the flawed system. You know, we've had instances where people have had, um, you know, crime labs have falsified evidence where, um, you know, the, it, most murders are, are, are convicted based on circumstantial evidence, not on eyewitness. And so, um, you know, could we make the case there's a biblical, I think it's in Deuteronomy, I don't know, one of the, Deuteronomy, I think, which, um, w w which suggests that, you know, a person shall only be put to death upon the, um, upon the, the testimony of two eyewitnesses. And those two eyewitnesses, if they bear false witness, are subject to the same penalty. I mean, if we want to go back to that, you know, maybe we can maybe we can make the case for the death penalty. But um, as long as you know, flawed human beings are are running the you know running the show, I think we have to be very careful about putting somebody to death.